Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone again for another evaluation session. Uh, it's always great to have uh, people join in and follow along and ask questions and tune in. So appreciate your time on this Saturday. And uh, just a couple of things up front, I guess, for anyone that wants to follow along with this Excel file that I'll be using, the same template um, is available on the website, whitetundra.ca. Scroll to the bottom under files and seminars, I believe it is on the left side, you can download the Excel file and follow along. I do also have a mailing list where I send out the actual files that we use. So the corporate presentation and such. So if you wanna get on that list, um, that's really all I send is the invite, the Zoom invites and the files. So uh, please email me or message me and I'll get you on there. Um, and then again, for anyone on the Twitter call, it will be audio only. The Zoom link and the uh, visuals are on the website. So please join there if you would like. I um, The Twitter spaces I'm just trying out still as an audio only tool. So, um, you know, we, we get quite a few people in there, but I can't take questions on there just because it screws up the audio with the recording. So uh, for any questions or to follow along, please join the Zoom link um, again, or feel free if you're driving or whatever, just, just listen, on, listen in on the audio as well. A um, Couple of other things up front. I'm not an investment advisor. Um, I do these kind of based on my own models, uh, the own spreadsheets that I've built and, and I found to be relatively good at distinguishing which companies are undervalued, overvalued between the sector. So um, it's been working for me and I'm happy to share it and kind of go through it. The, as I go, there, there will be kind of less and less of the in-depth stuff on these Excel sheets. Uh, because I find myself repeating the same thing over and over. So I'm, I am working on kind of an introductory little video uh, with Dirk here, and that'll kind of give you the heads up stuff um, so we can get through these a little bit faster. Um, and the previous videos are also available on the website. I think we've gone through 25 or 30 companies so far. Um, and then recently what I've done is tried to add my own little insight, what I know about the field operations, the wells, the assets, et cetera. So um, I love sharing sharing stuff like that from my experience. Um, but please do your own due diligence, your own portfolio risk tolerance before you um, invest in these companies and your kind of investment time frame. So that will be subjective to each person and kind of your own um, financial, uh, financial understanding, I guess I should say, and financial risk tolerance and how much you wanna risk, how much are you looking to make, uh, and what's your time frame on that? Um, this is also recorded. The link will be again on the website under archive seminars. The I don't share the exact um, Excel file with the companies filled in, but if you would like to compare, you know, a couple of them, I'm happy to share those just as a reference point. Um, the reason I don't like sharing the exact file is because I've been finding some people are treating that as gospel and just taking those numbers as a um, as that's what the, the share price is gonna be in 12 months when, you know, that's not exactly what I'm trying to say here. Um, so, um, but I'm happy to share for, for comparison purposes. My portfolio is on the website as well. I like to update it once every month and, um, you know, just share kind of what I'm, what I'm buying, what I'm selling. Uh, it's been mostly buying recently. So that's where I'm, I'm kind of at. Um, the fund is fully private. So I appreciate everyone that wants to invest with me um, in my fund, but I, I don't take any outside investment. So uh, once again, appreciate all the messages um, of that, but uh, it's just not the way that I'm, I'm gonna be taking this at this time. Um, feel free to ask questions on the chat. Feel, feel free to interrupt me as I'm going through it. It's more of a, a back and forth exercise that if there's a question about a certain thing that we're going through a certain box here, it's better to ask it right off the bat so we can, so we can get through it. Um, if, if you have the question, I probably have not explained it properly. So I'm sure other people have the question as well. I know it's a cliche thing, but uh, that's, that's pretty common. And feel free to message me after the fact. My email is on the website, my phone numbers. I've had excellent conversations um, so far. It's just been amazing. Like I say this every Saturday, but it's just gotten better and better. The conversations I have with people, the, the in-depth back and forth we get into, um, some of the conversations around, around the uh, taxes and the uh, business and, different service companies, et cetera, is just great. Um, and then for anyone that hasn't checked it out, the model I shared today 
based on the 57 companies that I track is going to be on the um, is already on the website under price targets. So that kind of shares with you what I came up with after doing these exercises with a deeper dive um, on the hedging situation and a, little, and a little bit of, I guess, juice added in based on what I think of the company, um, their royalty structure, their well results and how I see that coming along, um, that kind of thing. And for anyone that's joining this call um, who is a, in the financial business, you will, you will see that some things are not 100% accurate. Um, that's just how it's meant to be. It's meant to be a quick relative valuation tool to get through, um, find the top five, seven, 10, you know, 15, 20 companies, however many you wanna diversify into within the sector. And then we, we do deeper dives on those companies based on the ones that have the cash flow that produce the right amount of free cash flow um, before we really spend time going into the nitty gritty. So um, I apologize in advance. Some of the calculations are not exactly how you would like, but um, that's just how it is. So um, yeah, we'll get started here with uh, three companies, which they get talked about for a couple of days and then everyone ignores them. And I never, I never see them mentioned again. Um, so Paramount Resources, um, a, a pretty big power, powerhouse with a very strong management team um, with the Riddell family. You know, very well known, and they just kind of do their thing on the side. They they just you know mosey along, making money. Um, it's probably one of the highest performing or best performing stock since it's low. I think it's up forty x somewhere in there in two years. So, um, you know, it's it's odd that a stock like that is getting ignored, but that that's just how it seems to be. Um, Pipestone is the next one, which is kind of the the little kid of the. Um, the Monty producers, it's got renewed interest because Eric Nuttall just bought a 8% uh, share or something in the company. So it's got, it's got some news, but still, I, I barely hear anything about it. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll bring this one up. It's one I've written a Seeking Alpha article on, and I, ha and I had very high hopes for it. Um, and I guess I'll share why it's, it, it hasn't exactly panned out versus the rest of the uh, companies out there. And then IPCO, we had a Twitter spaces with their COO, um, which went awesome. And then, you know, people were talking about it for a couple of days and then bang, I didn't really hear about it for the last month or so. So, you know, maybe bring it back into the spotlight because it is one that I see big uh, free cash flow numbers always, but they just, you know, I get lots of questions uh, privately as, as to why I'm not in this company. And then maybe it's a great time to bring it up that it's not just free cash flow we should be looking at. There, there's other things. Um, other subjective things, I should say, that also make a huge difference to what's going on. Um, so, yeah, we'll get started. And again, anyone that joined here, Zoom call late, uh, the this spreadsheet is available on the website. If you want to follow along, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom. Um, it's the Excel template. There is a new template. So anyone that's using the old, old template, um, you might want to download the new one. I've simplified it a bit just to make things a little easier and um, take out some of the other fluff in there. Um, so yeah, we'll get started here. So we'll start with Paramount. Um, um, so let's put the company name in there so we can keep them all separate. The first thing we need is their production. So you always want the latest quarter of results. So whatever the latest number you have, you don't want to use mid quarter results or something they've thrown out in the news. You want actual audited financial statements um, because those are actually accurate and they will give us all the information we need as opposed to data points, you know, from one thing and not the other. So um, basically we pull up the 2021 annual results um, and you got to be careful with annual results because they give you both numbers. They give you the annual sales volumes and the Q4 volumes. We, we always want to use the latest three months of data um, or the latest data you have that's, that's actually in an in a audited annual statement or audited quarterly or annual statement. So fourth quarter sales volumes, 85, 265, 44% liquids. So that's exactly what we're going to put in. 85, 265, 44% liquids. Um, then we want to divide it up into what kind of oil and gas they produce because 
heavy oil gets a different value than light oils, than NGLs and gas. They all trade at different markets for different pricing. So we want to break it down into what exactly they're selling. Um, and usually all of this will be in the, in the MDNA um, or the Q4 results. So here we have sales volumes again for the three months ended. Uh, we have 32, 342 of condensate and oil, which would be light oil. So we'll put that in there, 32, 342. And NGLs, we have 5462. So we'll put that in there, uh, 5462. And NGLs are things like propanes and butanes, which they don't quite sell at the same price as oil, but they're still a liquid. So, so they get higher pricing than a lot of the um, gas stream per se. Um, and yeah, the gas production is going to be self-calculated based on the liquids percentage we put in. So that's already done for you. Um, the next thing we need is the shares outstanding. So um, basically, again, we look for it in the MDNA. Um, shares outstanding, common shares outstanding, 139.2 million. So the spreadsheet goes a certain way. Uh, please look at the units and put things in in the proper unit or else it, it does get screwed up. Um, and the stock itself was at um, 3180. So we're gonna put 3180 as a share price. That gives us our market cap, which tells you what's the value of all the shares of the company combined. Um, so about four and a half billion dollars is what the shares of the company are worth. The next thing we need is our current debt. Um, so we look at net debt here, which is 457 million. Um, I'm going to put that in there, 457 million as a net debt. Uh, for, for anyone that knows Paramount, their net debt is actually not correct. And I will share why here once we get through to the end. I have a couple of uh, slides here as to why it's not actually accurate because Paramount does things a little bit differently, um, but I'll leave that here to the end. Um, the annual dividend for Paramount, um, sorry, dividend is, so they did increase it to um, monthly dividend to eight cents a share. So you put that uh, annualized eight cents a month is 96 cents um, a year. And I should just say here, when you add up the market cap and the debt, you get to the enterprise value, which is the total value of the company. So if somebody wanted to come in today and say, look, I, I want to know what this company is worth today. What's the market telling me the company is worth along with the debt? Um, this is the number here, which is known as your enterprise value. You also have your debt to EV ratio, which these days is not so important because the commodity price is so strong, but um, it tells you how much of the company's value is in debt, which is important when the commodity price is lower because you don't want very highly debted companies. Um, they have a higher bankruptcy risk, but they also give you higher financial leverage, which if the commodity price is rising, gives you better returns going forward. So it's more of a subjective measure based on how you see things. Um, and and you know, 0 0.09 is very low. The company is basically debt-free. If this number is 0.5, that means 50% of the value is in debt, 50% is in shares and, and so forward. Um, so we've got the dividend, we've got the annual dividend uh, cash required to pay that uh, for the next year. The next thing we need is our adjusted funds flow. So adjusted funds flow tells you how much money did the company make if you take all expenses into account. So operating costs, the salaries, the uh, tax, uh, interest, all the uh, box of pens that they bought for the office, etc. Uh, so every single expense uh, taken into account is the adjusted funds flow. After that, if you remove the capital costs, so everything for drilling, completions, uh, your field equipment, and, and tie-ins, um, once you take that out, you get free cash flow. And free cash flow is important because free cash flow tells you how much money does the company have to give back to you for dividends, for share buybacks, for special dividends, um, debt deleveraging, acquisitions? That's all done out of free cash flow. So free cash flow is the final number 
that tells you how much money does this company actually make um, after every single cost, after keeping their production flat, how much money does the company make? So we need these two numbers. Um, again, they're gonna probably be in the same, um, same sheet here in the, in the MDNA. Um, so right there, three months ended, we have our adjusted funds flow, 175, free cash flow, 99. Um, so 175 and 99. And that's our last quarter's total free cash flow. Um, but the one thing we need to adjust for is hedging. So hedging is commodity contracts that companies get into where they say, okay, we will sell you X amount of barrels of oil for this amount of money. But the hedges change quarter to quarter. They change year to year. A lot of companies are now going hedge free into this, into this rising commodity price environment. So we need to take the impact of hedging out to tell us what did the company make from an operational perspective? If we take the financial, um, the, the financial extra uh, contracts and whatnot, uh, whatnot out of the equation, what did the company make from a strictly operational perspective? Um, and that number, do, do, do. So we have uh, unre or our search realized. And almost everything you need is in the MDNA. Um, you usually don't need to go into other financial statements and such. Um, the hedging can be a bit, bit harder to find because it's known as hedging. It's known as commodity price management. It's known as uh, risk management contracts. So um, there's a lot of stuff we need. Uh, to... Of course, I can't find it now. Do uh, unrealized, realized gains. And you always wanna look at realized gains because unrealized tells you the total effect of these hedging contracts for the next year um, or, or into the future. But what we need is the, what was the impact of that for the last um, quarter that you're looking at? So um, that's always the number we need. Um, so obviously I can't find it now. Risk management, okay, right there, it was in the first page. Um, risk management settlement contracts, um, was a loss of 72 and a half million. So because it's a loss, it goes in as, ne as a negative in here. So minus 72 and a half. Um, the share buyback, not, not that important and uh, it's not material anyway, so I'm gonna leave it. Um, so the company made without financial contracts on an operational perspective, they made $171 million uh, last quarter. But at what price? These this money was made at a certain price. We, when we're looking into the future, the prices are gonna change. The oil prices are gonna be different. The gas prices are gonna be different. So we need to know this money was made at what pricing? And that's known as benchmark pricing, um, which again, should be in here. Um, do, 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 as a... October to December, 2021, um, benchmark pricing. So the WTI, oh, hang on, that's not correct. Yeah, so commodity prices, uh, WTI price for Q4 averaged out to be 77.19. So that's the number we're gonna put in there. That 77.19 was the last quarter's pricing for WTI. We also need gas pricing. So the gas pricing, ACO spot for uh, three months ended, 441. So we're gonna put last quarter's gas pricing in there. We also need last quarter's NGL pricing because the company produces NGLs. So um, the condensate oil price, uh, I'm gonna use this number. Um, other NGLs price, which is not really accurate, but it's it gives us close enough to what we need. So 5461 
Canadian dollars, which in US dollars um, is roughly 42. So we're going to put that 40, 42 US is roughly 54 Canadian. So I'm going to put that in there, maybe 43. Um, okay. So we know this, this $171 million was produced at these three prices, WTI, NGL, and gas, which if we go back here, was there three products, um, and, or oil, um, NGL, and gas. Now we need to know what are these three pricings looking into the future? So for the next 12 months, what are these three prices gonna be for the next 12 months? So strip pricing WTI is from a website, um, rbcrichardsonbar.com is what I use. Um, it gives you the WTI 12 month strip pricing, uh, $98.34. So if you were to sell a barrel of oil, one barrel, um, one barrel every month for the next 12 months, this is the average price that you would receive. It's known as a strip pricing. Um, NGL, there's no real good, good NGL number. Um, so I'm gonna use, again, what they tell me for the US. Um, it's not always accurate, but it gets us close enough. Again, we're not trying to be fully accurate here. We're just trying to compare companies relatively, find the top X number of companies that you want, and then do a deeper dive onto those. So. Um, 53.42 a barrel uh, US. So I'm going to put that in there for NGLs. And then eco pricing is from a company or from a website, gasalberta.com. Um, you take the next, it gives you the pricing for the next uh, 12 months. You uh, add them up and you divide them by 12 and you end up at roughly $5. So, um, you know, if you take the next 12 months, divide them by or add them up and then divide by 12, you will end up at roughly $5. So that's what I'm gonna put in here. And that's it. Um, that's all we need to do for these companies. So it gives us a few numbers here, the spreadsheet does. And we have annualized last quarter's free cash flow. So if we take the last quarter's free cash flow and we annualize it, um, if we keep it at last quarter's pricing, that's the amount of money they would make for the year. So $747 million. If we take strip pricing, obviously it goes up. Um, if we take $120 oil, you know, it goes up. If we take $60 oil, um, et cetera, it goes down. Um, so a few points here. The free cash flow yield tells you how much of the total company's value is being generated as free cash flow. So at strip pricing, the company generates roughly 22.5% of its value today in free cash flow. And why is that important? Because that 22% is what's gonna come back to you in terms of dividends, um, share buybacks, debt deleveraging and acquisitions. So if the company hedged its entire production for the next year, they could pay out a 22.4% dividend right now. That's what this number is telling you. Um, and it changes obviously as you take different oil prices. What I do with this is I put an eight multiple on free cash flow. What an eight multiple means is I don't want 22.4% out of these companies. I think that's, that's way too much. Which company trades at 22% dividend yield for, for very long? None of them. So what I'm looking for is a 12.5% free cash flow. I think a 12.5% free cash flow gives me a good five, six, 7% dividend. It has a nice three or four to 5% buyback. Um, and the rest is gonna be used for debt deleveraging, you know, little acquisitions here and there, which is great. That's where I wanna be. If the commodity price is gonna stabilize in this, in this area for the next, you know, three, four, five, seven years, um, based on my macro outlook, that's, that 12.5% is what I want. Um, and if you take that 12.5% over eight years, that's where the eight multiple comes from. I want the company to buy itself out uh, or produce enough free cash flow that it's currently worth in the next eight years. So 12.5% times eight is, is exactly one, which is the value of the company. So uh, because 12.5% takes eight years to get into one, we use an eight multiple on free cash flow. 
So we, we take this number right here, multiplied by eight, that gives us a value of the company total. We then subtract the debt portion to give us the valuation for the equity and we get the fair share price that I see and I'm valuing the company at um, today, which would become then my 12 month target for the share price. Is there any questions off the Zoom here um, on that? Yeah. For anyone that's following along, any questions on that, that model that I use and, and how we got here? All good, okay. Um, the other thing I wanna point out here is when people say, oh, this company is trading at, at $70. This company is trading as if oil was $60. This is what they mean. At $70, you know, the current share price is 3180. At $70, it should be 3286. So um, that's what they mean is that when they run these numbers, the company is still trading less, less than it should be at a $70 oil uh, calculation. And when they say the company is worthless, I mean, this, this share never gets into the negative because they have such low debt. But when this number goes to zero, it's basically when the company's trading as if the shares um, are, are worthless. So at, at that price of oil, the company is in, a, is in a big chance that the shares are basically worth zero. Um, the other model that's used, you'll frequently see this, is an adjusted funds flow model. So why I like the free cash flow model is because free cash flow takes capital uh, expenditures into account. So any money spent on drilling, completions, et cetera, is already taken into account. So you don't need to be bothered about how good are their assets? How good are their wells? Um, how much of a recovery factor are they getting? How are their capital efficiencies? It's already baked in the decline rates. It's already baked in to free cash flow calculation. Whereas adjusted funds flow is more for a more, more sophisticated investor who's looking for, they wanna know a very conservative number and then they wanna run their own, um, own insight into the asset value, into the decline rates, et cetera. So I would use free cash flow times eight in most cases, that's, that's all I use. I don't even use um, this. I don't even use adjusted funds flow. I just have it in here because I kept getting pushback as to why I only use one model. So, um, so that's here. So class, uh, yeah, class has a really good question here. Do you adjust for the capex being different from quarter to quarter? So yes, when I do my deeper dives, what I will do is I will look at how much money is the company spending for the year or for next year. And I will divide that by four and I will instead adjust these numbers. So this tells me that the company spent $76 million on capital in Q4. So 175 minus 99, $76 million of capital. But some companies like gas companies, especially natural gas companies, um, some companies in Northeast BC that, that can't drill year round, their capital changes quarter to quarter a lot. So I do end up normalizing this in my deeper dives. Um, for the sake of this presentation, I don't. Um, I just leave it as is. It doesn't affect things too much, but once you do the deeper dive, you can find companies where this model is not really accurate um, because they have, uh, they've spent a bunch of money, they have high growth, et cetera. So take this with a grain of salt. You will miss the diamonds in the rough when you use this model, but you will be able to not waste time on companies that don't produce free cash flow. So it's not, there's no easy way to do things. You can either have it um, easy or you can spend the time and, and have the very, very deep understanding of the companies. Um, and I think a lot of people just don't have the time to be uh, valuing you know, 40, 50, 60 companies. So this gives you an upfront view. And then my goal is that within my portfolio and within my Twitter posts, I share, I try and share companies that are that maybe don't screen well on here, but that do end up uh, having a lot of upside just based on what I see. And that's where the price target spreadsheet that I've published also comes into play, where some of the companies you might run the numbers and they don't come on very good, but 
you see my price targets, what I'm seeing, um, and maybe that starts a conversation as to as to what's going on um, on a deeper level. But yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, there there's two models. I only use free cash flow times eight. AFF times four is very conservative. It's to be used if you have your own understanding of the of the company's assets, the company's um, acreage, the company's rock, geology, et cetera. That's when I would use this. Or if you just wanna be super conservative, um, this is the model you would use. And we can see at strip pricing, um, we're still trading below what the, what the spreadsheet tells us. Um, okay, so these numbers are unhedged because remember we took hedging out of the equation but when we're looking at these companies to invest in today, we need to add hedging back in. What, what hedges does the company actually have for the next year? So again, it's in the MDNA. So we'll go back. Uh, um, it's actually right at the top, I believe. Uh, do, yep. So this is what we have. We have the actual hedges for the next 12 months. Perfect. So. We have oil hedges at, at, at this price. We have more oil hedges at, at Canadian dollars. Um, you know, we have our, our collars. So you will need some sort of understanding of how hedges work. Swaps are straight up hedges. They get this price no matter what. Collars are a little bit different. Um, they get a range between these prices unless, unless the price is higher, at which point they, they just get this ceiling. So that's the maximum and that's the minimum. Um, I don't want to get into hedges. <clears throat> I don't want to get into hedges. It's, it's a very complicated um, calculation as to these three-way callers and such. But basically you add the number of barrels hedged at what price and you average them out. It's a simple um, calculation of an average, how you would, calculate an average for anything else. Um, you take the number of barrels, multiply them by the price, you add up all the contracts, and then you divide them by the total barrels. Um, and it's as simple as that. So I'm not gonna get into the calculation. I'm just gonna steal my numbers um, that I have. Um, so if you run the numbers, that's exactly what you will get. And if there's any discrepancies, please let me know. Um, the gas hedges, I haven't put them in for some reason. Uh, so let me, let me put them in here. Um, uh, basically at 80,000 at, so I guess I'll do the calculation with you. So there's 40,000 at US 415, which is roughly, let's say five and a half dollars Canadian. And we have 40,000 at 406 Canadian so you average them out, you get 80,000 at about 475 is where you end up. So um, pricing in Canadian dollars, 475 and 80,000 of them. Um, we'll, we'll run the same numbers. I, it doesn't affect the calculation that much. So I'm gonna leave it out for now. We saw that the first quarter only affected the numbers by like $2 million, which is not material. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna ignore it, but that is something that we should put in. And I don't know why I don't have them put in, in my, um, in my calculation here. Um, so yeah, after adjusting for hedges, we can see that they're losing a lot of money on their oil hedges as the price of oil goes up. Um, you know, at hundred dollar oil, they're losing $175 million. So hedge adjusted is how we wanna look at these companies always because the hedges do affect the calculation for the next year. Um, for sure. Um, okay, and then the other thing we need to add is production growth. Because if we are investing in the company today, you're not investing in a company that produces this. You're investing in a company that may produce more or less for 2022. So Q4 production was about 85, 250. What's, what's 2022 production? So if we go back here, uh, back to our uh, Q4 um, news release, we have 2022, 
2022 guidance is for production total between 91 and 95. So take the midpoint of that, we get to 93. Um, so they're gonna produce 93,000 BOEs and a little bit higher liquids content as well in 2022. So you take 93, you subtract what we were producing in um, Q4, you get an increase in production of roughly um, 7750, I believe, is what it ends up being. So again, 93,000 minus 85265, you will end up at roughly 7750. Uh, check that. Yep. And what's the net back on this growth? How much money are they making per barrel on this growth or per BOE, I should say? So the way we calculate that, we take our net back for um, our net back for Q4 was about $34 a BOE. Um, prices are higher than Q4. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna multiply that by an extra 20% on top of that. Again, we can get into the nitty gritty, do the exact calculations, but why? We need to go through a lot of companies. You need to find the ones that actually generate cash flow. If they don't generate cash flow, don't waste time doing these in-depth calculations. So again, 33.74, I'm adding 20% per BOE of net back because the commodity prices are higher um, and we end up at 40, um, $40 a BOE of growth net back and we get our, our new um, more in-depth table with two things built in. It's got hedging built in and it's got the growth uh, barrels built in. Um, so again, if you only want to go through this calculation and leave it there, if you have a long time frame of three, five, seven years, you don't care what the hedging is for the next year, go off these numbers. If your investment time frame is six months or 12 months or 24 months, I would do the math on the hedging and the growth because it does make a big impact to the short term time frame of where we're going. Um, this, this purple uh, box is with the gas price, different gas prices. And this is exactly what I put in on my uh, price targets spreadsheet. Um, so if you're looking at those and you're wondering where I came up with numbers, that's basically it right there. The next thing we'll do, um, and I won't do this for every company, but 2022 capital, because they have growth, obviously they're gonna be spending a little bit more money. So how much are they spending? We go back up here um, to our 2022 guidance. They're spending between 500 and 540 million. You take the midpoint 520. I'm gonna throw that in there as a capital program. If you feel they have other free cash flow sources, um, throw that in there. And basically again, on the price target spreadsheet, you will see I have these two numbers in there as well projected free cash flow at strip and free cash flow at strip unhedged. So that's where those numbers are coming from if you're looking at those. And um, that's, that's basically it. You can keep going through the calculation um, to get 2023 free cash flow, but I don't usually do that. It's just th thrown in there. Um, and basically that's, that's all I do. Um, are there any questions? as to how I ended up here or what I'm doing or the fair share prices or, or anything like that. Nope. Okay. Um, the one thing I wanna say about this spreadsheet is it's flexible. You don't have to do things exactly like, like how I'm doing them. If you think they're gonna knock it out of the park with their new wells, if you know someone at Paramount, if you know the field, you think they're gonna increase production by 12,000 instead, put 12,000 in there. If you think the net back's gonna be 40, $47, you know, put, put $46 in there, $47 in there. Um, you know, if you think the strip pricing for NGL is, is gonna be $60 a barrel, put that in there. The spreadsheet adjusts accordingly. If, if the projected gas price, you think it's gonna be $7 a gigajoule, you know, put that in there. It, it's, it's based on what you think is gonna happen I'm just showing you how I do it. It's not gospel. It's, it's a way that's worked for me. Um, so I like to share that.
Um, okay, so with Paramount, I'll share a few things. Paramount owns roughly 18% of New Vista. So the company New Vista Energy, um, Paramount owns 18% of that, which at today's pricing is worth somewhere between 450 to $500 million. So when I mentioned earlier that their net debt number is not accurate, that's why, because that's their actual debt in terms of their bank loans and their term debt, but they actually own, if they sold these shares today, they would get roughly $500 million of cash. So keep these things in mind. There, there's always extras, you know, things you have to sometimes see that are not obvious in the company's financial statements. So the company basically is debt-free if you take the value of these shares into account. Um, the other thing, um, Paramount has a lots of land that's worth a lot of money. Look at all these land, all this land in the oil sands area and by the clear water. The clear water is the up and coming formation where land is getting sold for a lot of money. And they, they have a lot of land by uh, the Martin Hills here, the Nipissey, the uh, Obsidian Baytex, a Peace River Partnership. So something to keep in mind again, companies might have extra value that is not obvious on the financial statements. And I see Rock Creek is on the call. So thank you Rock Creek for this uh, really great map. Um, and uh, again, all the yellow is their land. Um, and you know, it's, it's objective, put whatever value you want on this land. And then you can adjust your net debt number up here accordingly based on what you think. And you just keep on getting more and more accurate on the spreadsheet, the deeper dive you do. Um, the other thing about Paramount, they are active in the East Duvernay, which is another up and coming area that kind of got thrown out as a, as a dud, but at $100 oil and $5 gas is becoming more and more um, economic. So we know these Baytex wells are really good wells. We know the uh, Crescent Point wells are, are not as good. Um, Journey Energy, that's another name that has a lot of land or used to have this land. I don't know if they still do. And then Paramount. Is, is pretty active here in the East Duvernay. They might be the first ones to actually, along with Baytex, develop this play and prove it economic. Um, why is that important? Because Paramount in January, 2022, had the two, two best um, gas producing Duvernay wells in the entire country, or in the entire Duvernay, I should say. So maybe something to watch for is, is there a future development potential here on something that got written off as a zero? Maybe. And these two wells, I like pointing them out in particular because they've been online for about eight months now and they're still producing more gas than these newer wells. We know gas declines. So what does it tell you that a well that came online eight months ago is still, um, those two wells are still the top two producing wells um, in the Duvernay compared to other wells that came on in October and August and uh, July, or yeah, October and August, I should say. So these sorts of things, the market doesn't know these things. The, there's not enough investors in the oil and gas space who do this kind of deep dive and, and who would know and put value into these things. So if you can find companies like this with they own $500 million of Nevista shares, they own all this land in the Clearwater area, a heavy oil area. They have their wealth uh, results are top notch. Maybe something to look into um, more. And not only that, they own their own drilling rig company. They own their own supply chain and logistics company. Uh, they've got other basins that, that um, have been written off that they have land in. Um, another company here, and the Cavalier here, here is the one with the heavy oil acreage, which is 1.4 million gross acres is what they own um, in the Athabasca and Peace River regions. So heavy oil generates some of the best netbacks when the commodity prices are high. 
yuan companies with heavy oil exposure and 1.4 million gross acres uh, seems pretty interesting. Um, so, um, yeah, any questions on that, on some of these, these extra maps and whatnot? Um, what portion of the free cash flow is going towards dividends um, is the question. So um, let's say, let's take strip pricing, um, including the growth barrels. You know, that's the FCF on the eight multiple. You divide that by eight, you get roughly $900 million of free cash flow in the next year. And they're using about, um, where is it? They're using 134 for the dividend. So about call it 15% of the free cash flow is going towards dividends. So they could 6x the, the dividend tomorrow out of free cash flow, straight out of free cash flow. Um, so it's it's trading at a roughly 3% yield. They could pay out 18, 20% today if they wanted. So um, that's why I've been really talking about these companies and and they need to increase the dividend every quarter. I don't care what they tell you. If they can six X the dividend today, why can't they release every quarter a 10% increase, a 20% increase? You know, it, it's not out of the question to ask companies to do these sorts of things and get more eyes on the sector, get more interest in the sector and, and prove that they're actually generating this free cash flow, especially companies with such low debt. And we see Paramount's done that. They, they increased their dividend 33% on the last results. And I think this will, this will be one company, they might increase their dividend every single quarter for the next year here. So um, one to watch for, and then one that's gonna create good vibes, good news, um, actually walk the walk in the, um, in the news, news cycle. Um, okay. If there's no other questions on Paramount, I'll move to Pipestone and uh, go from there. Okay, right on. Um, do, so for anyone that joined late again, who wants to actually put the numbers in, in the spreadsheet, um, it's on whitetundra.ca. Scroll to the bottom, um, and see it's the Excel template file or something. I have it called. Um, this is a new template, so for anyone that's that's joined the previous seminars, um, you might want to update your template to, to this one. Um, okay, so the next one is Pipestone. Um, yeah, so the 2022 free cash flow yield at Strip um, is less. The reason for that is because the price targets spreadsheet that I've updated was based on March 13th Strip. The Strip price changes every day. So my, my spreadsheet is not 100% accurate, but in the next couple of weeks, I do have an update. Once I can get Google Sheets and Excel to, to work together, um, it will be live as to the latest um, Strip price. So I look forward to updating that as we go. Um, and yes, is that a good parameter to judge the company? That's exactly what I use. I pick the top five, seven, 10, 15 companies. And then I, I put my own flavor on them based on what I think. And uh, I invest accordingly. My portfolio will reflect that accordingly. Yes. Um, some companies have 40% free cash flow yields. Yes, you're absolutely correct. But there's other problems with the company. There's other reasons why I don't invest in them. IPCO, IPCO is one of them that has like a 42% yield. And I'll share why it, it's not in my portfolio um, once we get through the IPCO section here. Um, and I don't want these price targets to, to be gospel. Again, they're meant to be used as a relative valuation tool. I'm not just gonna buy the top companies in there just because they have free cash flow. I, I talk to management, I look at their well results, I look at where is the free cash flow going, I look at their operations, their assets, their uh, reserves, et cetera, and I invest based on that. My portfolio construction is also going to be different because I invest on margin as well. So I can't just pick the highest companies if they're gonna be volatile companies. You wanna have a good mix 
if you're investing on margin, you need to have a good mix of solid, stable companies with very, very strong shareholder bases along with these high torque companies. You don't just want to buy all these high torque companies, get margin called, lose all your money, and then the price of oil keeps going up and you're sitting there crying. So please keep that in mind. My portfolio construction is my own way of doing things. If you're not investing on margin, you might be able to get away with investing in, in, in higher torque companies. Um, but I'm not an investment advisor, so I'm gonna leave that up to your own due diligence and risk tolerance and a portfolio construction uh, based off of that. But thanks for the question, uh, always appreciate it. So the next one we'll get to is Pipestone here. It's the exact same thing we're gonna do. Um, MDNA is what we're looking for. Three months ended. December 31st, um, the production right here, 28,623, 44% liquids, 28,623, 44% liquids. Um, the production is broken down here in terms of our uh, condensate, which is light oil, is 8481, NGL uh, 3978. So 8481. 3978, um, shares outstanding uh, right here. So Pipestone is a company you wanna be careful with. They have a lot more uh, diluted shares outstanding than basic shares outstanding. So because there's such a huge difference, I'm actually gonna use diluted shares in this case. So 283 million um, shares diluted outstanding. You're welcome to use either or. Um, for most companies, it doesn't matter because the names, the, the, share, the shares outstanding are so close. In this case, there's a huge difference. There's a 50% difference. So I'm not gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm gonna take the most conservative number, um, the maximum number of shares outstanding and go off of that. Um, 518 is the share price. So put that in there. Um, net debt, again, we're using the exact same format that we used um, for, um, for Paramount. So 200, 204 million is the net debt. Um, annual dividend, Pipestone doesn't have a dividend. Adjusted funds flow um, right here. So we have our free cash flow is 20 million. Adjusted funds flow, 59 million. Um, so 59, 20. Hedging impact, exact same thing. Uh, so I'm gonna calculate hedging impact a bit differently here because some companies don't report it. So loss on commodity contracts was $8.45 a BOE. So you take $8.45, you multiply it by 28,623, which was a number of BOEs produced um, in Q4, multiplied by 92, the number of days in Q4, 22 million was a hedging loss. Um, so again, dollars lost per BOE multiplied by BOE multiplied by days in the quarter gives you the, the dollars lost per quarter, 22 million. I'm gonna put that in there. Uh, again, because it's a loss, it goes in as a negative minus 22. Um, strip. The last quarter pricing doesn't change. The strip pricing doesn't change. I believe it was 9863. Get it again from RBC Richardson Bar .com. Um, 9834, sorry, is a 12 month strip on WTI. Um, and for anyone that joined late, please, um, you will have to watch the recording as to what I'm doing here a little bit more. Um, there's no reason for me to go through everything over and over. So um, the, the Paramount, always the first company that I cover, I go through everything in detail, what everything means here. And then after that, we just kind of go through the, um, whoops, go through the, uh, go through the calculations quickly, um, just for the sake of time. And because we're using the exact same terminology for, uh, for every company. Um, the NGL pricing, average realized prices for NGLs was 44.30, which in Canadian dollars, roughly 35. 
Um, the strip pricing, again, you're welcome to use whatever number you want. Um, I believe it was 5362. Um, so, so I'll put that in there. Projected gas price again, $5 based on Gas Alberta, based on what we use for, for Paramount, the exact same. And we get the exact same numbers for the free cash flow. Um, one thing I'll point out, let's look at Paramount here. At, at strip pricing, if the shares are, are $32 and the spreadsheet gives you 52, you're looking at roughly a 70% upside potential to the share price. We look at Pipestone, um, sorry. We look at Pipestone, um, 7.95, again, roughly 55, 60% upside. So they both screen decently well so far, but as we go on, you'll see why our Pipestone falls behind or, yeah. So I'm gonna, again, steal the hedging data because it's the exact same way of calculating hedges. Um, so uh, the hedging will be in the, um, mostly in the corporate presentation. They will have their hedge book, uh, updated hedge position. This is exactly what I'm using here. You'll see um, these are the exact numbers that are put in here and in here um, taken right off what they tell me. Um, production growth. So Q4 production was 28,623. Um, 2022 production is going to be, uh, let's just find it here. Um, two, two, two. So 2022 production is roughly 32,000. So I'm taking the midpoint here again. Um, that gives us roughly 3,500 of production growth. So 32,000 minus Q4 production equals our production growth. The net back that they got for Q4 uh, was $25. I'm gonna give them again a 20% boost on that. So $30 a BOE. And that's where we end up. We have um, the final spreadsheet here. And they give us our 2022 CapEx is 215 million. So I'll throw that in there. And um, that's that, we're done. It, once you get one or two of them done and you understand the methodology, it takes like 10 minutes or 15 minutes a company. You, you can jam through oil companies, gold companies, tin, silver, copper, uranium, whatever you want. You can, you can use the same spreadsheet for basically any commodity producer and go through companies very, very fast um, and, and find your top picks. Um, so we look at Paramount, their free cash flow strip, unhedged 18%, hedged um, 16%. Pipestone is very, very different. Um, 11, so I should say, we're using different strip numbers here. So I wanna, I wanna just go back to the March 13th strip because I have the same strip calculations done already. So 16% versus um, Pipestone is at 11.6%. So automatically Pipestone is off my list. I'm not even gonna bother doing a deeper dive on this company because they just don't generate the free cash flow I need. Um, at this point. So I had Pipestone in my portfolio. I wrote the article on it, as I said, but um, it's gone. I don't think I would look at Pipestone um, at this point. If you compare Pipestone to other producers in the Mondi, so look at Kelt, look at Spartan Delta, look at Arc Resources. And if you look at the price target spreadsheet I have on the website, you will see why I don't talk about Pipestone at all because it just does not compete on a free cash flow perspective and therefore it gets knocked out um, early on here. Um, so the question here is that looking at your model, where can you see inefficiency? So there's a lot of inefficiency here because we don't look at the companies deeper. We, we're just looking at the basic free cash flow calculations. A lot of as, um, 
asset analysts or company analysts, they look at net asset value, which is based on reserves. It's based on how much oil do they have in the ground. So their model is gonna differentiate based on the actual oil in the ground. My model looks at today, how much money does the company make? That's all that I really care about. Um, when, I, when I run my own calculations, I will change these numbers as I go. If I think the production growth can be different, I will change that. If the well, like in the example of Paramount, their wells are so top tier in the Duvernay that I might increase my production growth number. I might change my um, NGL number. I might change my projected gas number based on what I think about LNG, what I think about coal to gas switching within Alberta, et cetera. Um, but I think this model is your best model if you only have limited time and you wanna go through 20, 30, 40, you know, 50 different companies, this model gives you the best value for your time. You will get, uh, you will be able to differentiate between companies worth diving into and companies that, that just don't generate cash, even if they have billions of barrels in the ground, if they're not making cash, what's the point? Because we have a shifting mindset in Canadian oil and gas towards dividends, share buybacks and deleveraging. If the company doesn't generate cash to, to do those three, they're gonna get left behind in the dust. If they don't have a juicy dividend with a strong share buyback and low debt, um, they're gonna get le left behind. And which is why I think this model for today's date is very, very um, relevant. And, and in my opinion, what I use and, and it's worked out really well um, for me again. Um, for industries other than oil, hedging will not be applicable. Um, to an extent, a lot of companies also hedge their gold production, their zinc production, their copper, et cetera. I don't know enough about those industries to, to tell you how much, but it's nice having the hedging box in here because if they do hedge, you just, you change barrels to uh, megatons of copper or ounces of gold and you just do the same spreadsheet accordingly. Um, um, Pipestone, yeah, so what's the problem with Pipestone? The, the problem with Pipestone, in my opinion, in today's date is they have too many diluted shares outstanding. They have these, these people that own shares based on when the company formed um, that, that they, they got all these shares and it's really weighing down the company. Also why I'm a big, I've been getting more and more against Saturn Oil and Gas because they, they keep producing all these shares um, right at the start. And it may not matter right now, but a year or two or three down the road, these sorts of things really start to affect the company. These diluted shares and warrants and options outstanding, they really put a headwind on the stock. So I hope that's what you were asking, um, but Pipestone has that going against it. Also, let me go through my, my rest of my uh, presentation here and you'll see some of the things. Um, Pipestone is developing their top acreage first. That's a fact. So people who are looking at this in detail are seeing that, okay, they are developing their top acreage first and they're also consolidating their wells in the same area. Why is that a problem? Because although they have all this land, once they get to drilling here, they have to spend money on field compression, on uh, uh, field gas separation, oil separation. They got to build pipelines. So the company is going to have to spend more and more capital as they go to exploit the rest of their acreage. And people know that. People know that there's ample, you know, look at this map here and where, where they're drilling. There's a lot of um, compression. There's a lot of processing facilities in this area already. But as you go into this acreage, the analysts know, the investors who are putting the time in know, this, the capital efficiencies are gonna be way worse once they get to this acreage. So um, the little things that are not highlighted are really affecting this company. Um, I'm big on the Motney producers, as you know, 
So here's a supply of condensate, which is used as a diluent in Canada for the heavy oil traveling south for the bitumen. Um, we're importing condensate from the US. It's just about the only product that we import from the US. So there's always gonna be a market for condensate. Condensate currently trades at three to $5 above WTI. So Pipestone is gonna do well anyway, especially if gas, uh, eco gas can also keep increasing to five, five and a half, six dollars. I think they'll, they'll do really well, but within their peers is what you wanna to compare to. You can't just buy every company in the sector. Um, you can, but it's not gonna give you the best returns. So um, that's why I look at these things. Keep in mind the capital cost required for processing facilities, for pipelines, for gas compression. Gas compression. This map is awesome because it shows you where the activity is, where the facilities are, and which people are having to spend money on facilities and, and along with the money to spend on the wells to begin with. Um, another great chart here, um, top oil and liquids producing money wells for January. Pipestone is not in there. So compared to Paramount, which was producing the top wells in the Duvernay, Pipestone is not in here. Um, keep that in mind. You, you want companies that are overperforming the type curves that are outperforming the the uh, average well in the area, you know, Pipestone doesn't have anyone in the in the top 15 for January 2022. It doesn't have any a single well in the top 15 for the top oil producing wells in the last 12 months by cumulative oil. And those are facts. And these are things that when I do my deeper dives, I really look at these charts. I look at these tables. You want to identify companies that are outperforming and without naming names, if you look at these two charts, there's a name in here that's basically one of, one of my biggest holdings, despite constant share price underperformance. Um, and I continue to hold on to that name for now anyways. And, and I think you can identify why, um, you know, same with Spartan Delta, they got a couple of wells in here and why I'm big on their acreage as well. Um, White Cap has one in here. Um, you know, find find names that outperform. Find names that drill good wells. Find names that have really good production operations. Um, in 110, 115 oil price environment, that's what you want to invest in. Not companies that are um, suffering with with issues on their production operations that are not drilling good wells. Um, so again, just just little things that end up mattering in the end a lot. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, yeah, so that's all I have for Pipestone. Any questions on that? They recently put out a news release that they had to um, lower their 2022 production number because of facility issues and, and gas production issues and whatnot. So not, not the news that you wanna hear um, in, in these sorts of um, environments. Um, there's a question as to, are there any companies that made money on hedging? Um, yeah, oh yeah. A lot of companies made a ton of money on hedging in 2020. Uh, Meg Energy would have gone bankrupt without their hedging. Um, so, you know, hedging does help you, but you want to understand the macro and where oil is going, right? So if oil prices are in a rising commodity environment, companies that are hedging into that, I, I don't think is a good, good sign because that tells me they don't really understand the macro. And yes, you always wanna buy insurance, agreed. But if you're buying insurance, like if you're driving in the street and the roads are empty and you're buying $200 million of insurance on your personal vehicle, somebody might question your sanity as to, do you really understand the risk reward properly? So. Yeah, you should buy insurance, but not so much insurance that you're, you don't know how to run the company in a way. Um, and again, not saying that management doesn't know how to do this or do that, but hedging is not always good. If you're over hedging, it means you don't really understand your business model in a way. 
if you're buying insurance against everything you do, you, you might not be fully understanding what you're doing. Um, Canada is increasing by 300,000 barrels a day. Where is that coming from? Um, that's funny you mentioned that because at the end of IBCO, I actually have a uh, little chart that shows you where the production is coming from um, and what I think. So I'll leave that for then. Um, so the other question here is, I see you're taking eight times uh, for a one year target purpose. Can we take four times? Um, you can take whatever you want. Um, if, if you know how to play with Excel, I mean, all you do is you go in the template and instead of taking free cash on eight multiple, adjust this calculation here to be a four multiple and, and this here as well. Um, so feel free to play with the spreadsheet. That's why I like sharing it so that people can use it to their own, you know, whatever they think is gonna happen as opposed to taking my numbers or as a fact. Um, and I just wanna make one thing clear. We're not using eight times price to earnings. Earnings doesn't mean anything in oil and gas. It, it's a waste of a metric. It can be manipulated either way. I could start a company tomorrow and show you a, a company that's a 500 times price to earnings consistently for the next 10 years. It doesn't mean anything. Um, we're using free cash flow, which is in my opinion, all that matters as a financial metric um, along with net asset value. So please don't compare these, these free cash flow numbers to price to earnings in tech and in, uh, in real estate and all that. It, it's apples to, it's not even apples to oranges. It's like comparing uh, like fruits and vegetables. It's, it's just totally different um, metrics to begin with. So I just wanna, I just wanna uh, keep that, uh, make that clear. Um, free cash flow is after taxes. So free cash flow takes everything into account, which is awesome because you don't need to be worried about what's happening in, in one company because um, free cash flow is literally after everything, um, which is which is really where you want to be as an investor. Um, you know, you don't want to spend time looking at decline rates and capital efficiencies and and all this other stuff, which is tough to understand to begin with. Um, as somebody who's worked in oil and has a background in in oil, um, so so I think to go too much into the details is 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 just not worth the time in a way. Um, can you explain enterprise value again? Yes, so enterprise value is your market cap plus your debt. Market cap is the total value of the company's shares. You add debt on top of that. So if, if someone want, wants to buy your company, they have to pay A, what your shares are worth, and B, they have to take on the debt that you, that you owe. So you add those two, you get enterprise value. Um, I think that's a simple explanation. I don't know if you were looking for something else, but um, the free cash flow times eight and the free cash flow yields we have um, give us how much money does the company generate against its EV. Um, there's a comment here that you have to deduct cash. Yeah, so that's why whenever I put debt in here, it's net debt, which is debt minus cash. So. Um, you're right. Market cap plus net debt is EV. So, um, yeah, thanks for uh, clarifying that. Okay, so I'll move on to IPCO. Um, International Petroleum, we had the Twitter spaces on this. Um, no, I just don't want to take questions, uh, Razor, just because it, it screws up the audio for the Zoom recording. But, um, but, I will open up the Twitter space for questions after we get through the um, seminar, which, which shouldn't be very long here. So um, just hang tight. Okay, so we'll get started on IPCO. Um, there's a question here on, can you explain how pipeline companies increase or decrease revenue? Um, it doesn't change with the oil and gas price and why I don't buy royalty companies and I don't buy pipeline companies because I believe in a higher commodity price environment and I want companies with cork to that. Um, 
royalty companies do get extra money if the oil price goes up because they get a percentage of the revenues. So to some extent they benefit, but you, you don't really get the higher torque with pipeline companies and royalty companies. Um, I, would, I would more so look at producers. If you think oil price is gonna be 60 to $70 for the next 10 years, feel free to buy royalty companies because there's very little downside risk um, to them. Um, yeah, Stephen, uh, thank you for this question. I will get to it at the end when we have the Q&A session, um, just so everyone can, uh, everyone who wants to look at only the valuations can have a look and then leave um, or, or feel free to stay on and then we can get to these uh, other Q&As. Um, so IPCO, International Petroleum, we had our, um, we had our Twitter Spaces session with uh, William Lundin, which was awesome, I think. Um, and then we just st stopped talking about the company. So um, I'll go through the production here. So fourth quarter 2021 production was 46,800. Liquids would be 46 plus 18. So 64% liquids, 46,800. 46,800, 64% liquids. Um, and I'm just gonna take the numbers they're giving me here. 46% um, is oil, so, or it's heavy oil. So 46,800 times 46%. Um, we have light oil, so 46,800 times 18%, and the rest is gas, obviously. Um, shares outstanding. So we have um, 155 million shares outstanding uh, as of December 31st. So 155 million, I believe the share price, share price was 11.96. So I'll throw that in there, 11.96. We have our market cap and the exact same thing we're doing. Again, once you do a couple of these, it, it's basically like clockwork. You can get through probably 40 companies in a day if you really wanted. Um, net debt, 94 million US. That's US dollars, 94 million. So um, IPCO reports everything in US dollars. Keep that in mind. Um, there's, there's certain companies that report US dollars. So don't get fooled by uh, what's going on here. Um, so 94 times uh, one point, whatever, two seven roughly. So we have our current, uh, this should be net debt. And I'm gonna fix that because that's leading to a lot of problems, I think. Um, no dividend, um, adjusted funds flow, um, upper free cash flow in $87 million first. $87 million of free cash flow. So 87 multiplied by the change rate. Um, always look for the three months ended December 31st details. This is misleading and a lot of companies report both kind of close by. You always want to look at the latest quarter of information. Um, the, so for some reason, IPCO doesn't report their capital for the quarter, which is really strange. Um, but anyway, I'm going to I'm just going to use operating cash flow for now. So, so 111 is going to be your adjusted funds flow. Uh, 111 multiplied by 1.27. So there's that. The hedging impact, they don't report it. Again, you might have to do some work on, on these sorts of things. So the Q4 hedging, or the 2021 entire hedging settlement was 33, $33.5 million loss. The nine months ended September was $23 million. So we take 33 for the year, we subtract what they lost in the first nine months, we get to about $10.5 million of hedging loss for Q4. Um, so again, exchange rate uh, should be in, in minus. Um, again, how I did that is because they don't report the Q4 hedging loss on, on its own, I took the entire years of hedging loss and I subtracted the hedging loss for the first nine months which gives me the hedging loss for the last three months. So these companies that are not, not really based in Canada, 
um, they're they're always going to have trouble with it with getting investors. I three ener energy, one I've discussed um, heavily in the past. One uh, one we're going to be doing the calculations next week. Um, if anyone knows management at these companies, you please tell them you have to report like to Canadian standards. Until you do that, you're going to be losing out on an investor base that just doesn't care. They're not going to go through doing calculations like they are here. Um, so, yeah, again, if you know people at those um, companies, please tell them we would like to have a Canadian uh, financials on the side, which would really help with, um, with how we do things. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about this IPCO thing here as well, uh, Robert. Uh, very interesting point you brought up and one that I don't really agree with um, as to why, why they did this. Um, okay, so anyway, so we have this. The last quarter's pricing doesn't change. The strip pricing doesn't change. The WCS pricing, um, WCS, WCS pricing I use for the last, um, for Q4 would be the Alberta Economic Dashboard, um, which gives you the price. We have uh, December, January, or December, November, and October, which makes up Q4. You take these three, you average them out, um, and I believe we ended up at something like $62.52. Again, take the three months, add them up, divide by three. It's just a simple average. The strip pricing for WCS and why we're using WCS in this and we didn't in the last two was because the last two didn't have any heavy oil production, whereas IPCO does. So we need to add the WCS pricing. I'm gonna take for strip pricing WCS a $13 differential. So I'll basically take 98.34, subtract $13, we get 85.34. Um, they don't produce NGLs, so we don't need to put that in. The gas pricing was 451. Projected gas price is five. IPCO has some operations in Europe and Malaysia, so this gas pricing that they're getting is not 100% accurate. I've got so many emails about Vermillion, and people think I made a mistake in my price target spreadsheet. I think that those, those price targets are accurate because Vermillion's gas pricing is so different than every other company, except maybe besides IPCO, but IPCO um, just doesn't produce enough European gas to really impact the calculation, but something that if somebody wants to do a, a deeper dive on it, um, you should. Um, maybe they don't produce any gas at all. Uh, it's all oil. Uh, so yeah, thank you for this. Um, thank you for the point. So we can see already that IPCO, uh, something wrong here. Last quarter's pricing, strip pricing. There we go. So um, I don't know how that got deleted, but anyways, um, we can see how IPCO already screens way better compared to Paramount and Pipestone. I mean, these numbers are, are eye pop and it's, it's way more than where we were on, on Pipestone with, uh, you know, 16% free cash flow yields. IPCO is at, is at uh, 42%, like looking amazing. And on top of that, IPCO doesn't hedge. So you don't have any hedging losses. Awesome. Um, as far as production growth, they said they would produce, or they produced 46.8 in Q4. Their um, 2022 number. So 2022 guidance, uh, where do we have it here? Um, 2022 production is between 46 and 48. So 47,000 barrels, which is not materially different. So basically no growth. So I'm gonna leave that blank. And um, that's basically that. The, 
the capital program is $127 million. So convert that to Canadian dollars. So 127 times that, and we get just an eye-popping yield here. The free cash flow yield is just insane compared to, um, you know, Pipestone was at 13% unhedged, Paramount was at 18 and 15, IBCO is at um, 40%. So looking great. And I think it's fair for people to ask me why I'm not in pipes or in IPCO, why, why am I not buying this company? So the biggest reason is because, like I said, I think this company is gonna lag just because people don't know them. They don't really have their management in Canada. They don't report results the same way. Um, there's only so much appetite for Canadian assets in the European market um, where, where their headquarters are. So we see it's been lagging for a while. Um, if you're looking for a high torque play with low debt and you're looking for huge share price appreciation potential, there's your name right there. This screens as a top name on free cash flow yields on free cash flow generation going forward. Um, so, so why am I not invested right here? I think they will be sanctioning the Black Rod project going forward. Black Rod is a SAG D project um, with initial production of 20,000 to 30,000 BOEs or barrels of oil. It requires $540 million US. So all this free cash flow is probably or maybe not coming back to you. It's not gonna come back to a dividend. Um, they already have a share buyback going on. So I think instead of the money coming back to you, the money is gonna go back into capital, which the market is not really looking for right now. Um, the break even is quite high at $50 a barrel. Um, and I just think that's where the money goes. I'm not interested in investing in companies that are growing production in something where you don't get the production up right away. If they invest this $540 million today, the, the first oil right here tells you is going to be four or five years later. If I told you that a company is producing a bunch of cash, but they're gonna use that cash to jam dollars back in the ground and they don't get any oil for four or five years, that would turn away probably 50, 60, 70, 90% of the oil investor today. You know, again, I'm just assuming and I'm just saying what I think, but, but there's a reason people don't want to invest here. And on top of that, they put out a $300 million US bond um, that they recently took from the market when their net debt was only um, up here. Their net debt is only about $120 million Canadian. So why would they create a bond and take money from the market, term debt, for about $375 million Canadian? Because they want to sanction a project? Um, again, just my opinion. And I don't have any proof that they're going to do this this year or next year or the year after. But look at their corporate presentation. Most of the contingent resource is BlackRock. Do you think they want to bring this up and, and get their resource numbers up, their net asset values up? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. So again, I'm, I'm just guesstimating. Um, and the, there's a comment here that they have a shareholder re return policy on what they plan to spend um, on buybacks and dividend. And if something changes and they come out with a huge 20% dividend, I'm happy to invest in this company that day. As long as I can get shares at a good price, I'm happy to invest. But until then, there's too much headwinds. There's too much unknown. What are they doing with the money, et cetera. Uh, you can play with the definitions as well. If you're saying that 50% of your free cash flow is gonna be dividends, well, if you spend more capital, it no longer becomes free cash flow. So you, you no longer have to live up to that expectation in a way. Um, again, I'm guessing here, I'm throwing out accus accusations of, of what's going to happen with the money, but we don't know. We don't know what's happening with BlackRock. It's just not clear, and it's a big enough part of the company 
that the story needs to be told as to what's happening. Why, why did you create a $300 million US bond when you had no debt? You say you're not looking for acquisitions. So what else can the money be spent on? You know, one plus one equals two in my head. And that's just what I'm gonna go with. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna leave it, leave it to that. Um, I like bringing this, this chart up because it shows, people keep saying in the public markets that Western Canada doesn't have enough pipeline egress. Western Canada is, is gonna suffer from heavy oil differential. No, not at all. We don't even need Keystone XL. We're already overpiped all, all the way till 2024, 2025. We have way too much pipe um, capacity. We have crude by rail, another 200, 250,000 crude by rail capacity. So the differential blowouts are a thing of the past and um, potentially, potentially also why I really love Canadian heavy producers because um, there's so many positives, there's so many tailwinds to that, um, to that subsector that people are spreading nonsense in the public markets. And I'm happy, I'll invest now. I'll let the free cash flows do the talking. I'll let the share buybacks and the dividends do the talking. Um, and people in the media can go ahead and say whatever they want because um, it doesn't really matter. The, the truth always wins out in the end. You know, once the money talks, people uh, start listening to the money, not the media. Um, doo -doo, so, um, yeah, so again, the IBCO Onion Lake project is very close to Serafina's uh, assets. Serafina is a private producer that I can tell you they're on the block. They're, they're ready to sell and they're gonna sell for about one to $1.2 billion somewhere in there, maybe more now. And uh, is IBCO buying Serafina? We don't know. So too much, too much unknowns as to what they're doing with the money. If they, if they came out with a 20% dividend today, I bet you the share price doubles in, in a month. That's, that's not out of the question, but we don't know what they're doing with the money. So it might just sit here until, until it's more uh, clear. And look at the amount of slides they have referencing BlackRock. It's, it's a crown jewel. It's a gem for this company. They really care about this project. They've spent seven years doing successful pilots on, on this project. So when you keep throwing out slides re referencing to this project, the average investor is gonna think that's where your money is going. Um, and I also like to point the slide out because it shows you, you can't just start SAG the operations tomorrow. They've been at it for seven years and they still can't figure out if they wanna start it or not. Um, I mean, the oil pricing obviously was different for the last seven years, so it changes things a bit, but it still takes a lot of time. By the time you run your pilots, you get the land, you get the facilities built, you put the money in, etc. It's, it's, it's not just tomorrow. You know, three hundred thousand barrels are going to come online. So, the three hundred thousand barrels a day number that the government throws around is from projects that are already going to come online for this year. So, I, I believe Imperial Oil's Aspen project is seventy-five thousand barrels a day. Um, Suncor has a couple, I believe. CNRL has some here and there. Um, so, they all kind of add up to three hundred thousand anyway. And I don't think we get there regardless. Um, Suncor's Fort Hills recently launched its uh, second train, I believe, or, or third train. So they're adding 75,000 barrels there. So the government is misleading you. They're using the lowest numbers for each project and then saying, oh yeah, we can add 300,000 off that. Um, on the aggregate, I don't think Canadian heavy production or Canadian oil production goes up 300,000. Um, again, just my opinion and um, just kind of what I'm seeing, but I'm happy to hear pushback. And if someone has an actual list, um, I would love to see that. And it just gets my calculations more and more accurate. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, so thank you, Dirk, for, for sharing the actual text. So it says, we, we plan to distribute 40% of free cash flow. If they start jamming money into capital, the free cash flow goes down because free cash flow is after capital expenditures. So keep these little wording tricks in mind. Um, 
as to what they're telling you here. Um, so, yeah, so um, who's management and, okay, so that's the end of the valuation session. Um, the recording will be posted uh, by tonight. The, if you wanna watch me go through the other companies, I think I have roughly 30 companies now we've gone through. The recordings are on the website. Um, thank you for joining for that portion. The template is available on the website as well, uh, right on the homepage, scroll to the bottom. The template is over there for your own download. If you wanna compare the numbers, the price targets spreadsheet on the website gives you a rough idea of what I ended up with. I did more deeper dives into the companies and adjusted numbers accordingly. So there might be a bit of a difference, but it's relatively accurate. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of that on the on the valuation side of things. I'll open it up to regular Q and A at this point. Um, so okay, so um, whose management and owners do you have most confidence in? Um, I have confidence in managements differently. I I do have confidence in in a lot of management teams, but there's two things I look for. The story needs to be clear. So where's the money going? What are you spending money on? How much money are you making? That needs to be clear. And B, the management's macro outlook needs to be clear. If you're putting $40 WTI in your corporate presentation as a comparing your revenue against it, uh, maybe not a good sign. If you are not aggressive enough with what's going on, if you're just waiting to pay back all this debt forever, and you don't think oil prices are gonna stay you know, at this range, maybe not a good sign because why are you paying back all your debt? Debt is a good thing. For a commodity producer, you want debt, you want financial leverage so you can, you can grow, you can have money um, that's not strictly shares. So any company that keeps changing their mind on how much debt they wanna pay, any company that has a goal of going debt free, um, just, just loses my confidence a bit. Um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. It's not really, um, it changes based on what they say every quarterly results. I do have management teams that I really enjoy talking to. Um, Surge Energy, um, Razor Energy. These are two that, I, that recently I've had chats with and really enjoyed, enjoyed the conversation. Um, on the big names, I like kind of what, what, what Meg is telling me. I like white cap a lot now. Um, I wasn't a big fan of it previously because they used to trade at a premium, but now they do, or now they don't. And I was able to get in at a you know, fall in price um, and really load it up on the shares and the options there. Um, I just wanna say none of this is investment advice. This is just what I'm doing um, and, and kind of what I'm seeing. Um, Where's the pipeline capacity growth coming from? So. Enbridge Line 3 was a big one that added 300,000 plus barrels of capacity. Um, we're seeing mainline optimizations from Enbridge. We're seeing optimizations on the Keystone, the original Keystone, um, more pump stations, um, et cetera, which is adding a lot of pipeline capacity growth. And um, Trans Mountain is bringing on another, another 600,000 600, barrels of capacity in the next, uh, let's say early 2024. You know, that's what I, I think is going to happen. So, uh, yeah. Um, key phrase. So, yeah, always read the wording closely on what companies are telling you. They employ lawyers and accounts um, who get paid a lot of money. So they will, they will legalize and screw around with the wording on a lot of things. So um, just, just keep these things in mind. Um, could you please look at New Vista in the next session? So I have my April 2nd session booked already. Um, it's gonna be a European company focused. So I'm looking at uh, I3 Energy, I'm looking at Serica Energy, and I will be going back to Vermilion Energy and why, why these are poised to benefit from European exposure. Um, I3 is, doesn't have European operations, but they have this North Sea asset that they recently sanctioned. And I wanna talk more about what that means um, for, for that company. So that's that. Um, the April 16th session 
is I have three companies there already. And then um, the, the one after that, I, I'm happy to add new business in there um, and share more. Um, is your portfolio up to date? So the website is up to date other than me adding white cap, um, which I will update here as soon as the month rolls over into April. And I did sell my April options of um, Synovus as well. So just two things. Um, weren't the bank something to do about debt? Yeah, you're right. Yep, the bank debt uh, needs to be taken out completely. Agreed. But some of these companies that are talking about lowering debt have no bank debt to, to begin with. Um, you know, somebody like a Synovus and hate to target them again and again, but um, again, they keep talking about bank debt and well, Synovus didn't talk about bank debt. I should say in general, companies keep talking about, we don't want bank debt, we don't want bank debt. Well, that doesn't mean you should get rid of debt entirely. So, you know, I'm a little unhappy with, with companies that have totally got rid of debts and they want to get to like this 0 0.5 or lower uh, debt to cash flow. Like it's just almost too low because if the commodity price environment is a hundred plus range, is an 80 plus range for the next four, five, six, seven years, um, you want debt. As a shareholder, you want debt. You want lots of debt, as much debt as you can have because that means your share price is going to do that much better. Um, you want no bank debt, you want term debt, termed out to 2030 and 2027. Um, great, great place to be. Um, First Helium seems to be attractive from a cash flow perspective. What's your opinion? Um, I don't have an opinion on First Helium. I looked into them. They were a helium company who hit oil and now they're like a oil play with helium on it. Um, I should have bought stocks when they hit oil. I'll leave it at that. Right now, it's just trading too richly for me to, to really care about it. But um, when they first hit oil on that four of 29, well, I believe it is, that's when I should have bought a bunch of stock because the helium investors didn't understand it and they didn't really market it to the oil investors. So there's a portion there where um, I should have realized what, what was happening. I did run the numbers. Um, yeah, hindsight is 2020. Um, do you see Suncor management turning things around? Um, I can't talk about Suncor. I have a conflict of interest with a close family member working there. Um, so I apologize. There's, there's about 10 companies that I can't talk about. Um, no, that's wrong. There's about two or three companies that I can't talk about. There's 10 companies I can't invest in for various reasons, given my, uh, my closer connection with the industry um, and my experience and history. Um, Southern Lights Traversal. I would... I would say there's less and less of a chance it's going to happen if the if the Canadian production doesn't increase substantially. There's less and less chance that Southern Lights will get um, reversed. Line 13. Um, why is that? Because they have a full slate of condensate coming up. So why would they reverse something that's getting full uh, throughput already? If we had another million barrels of Canadian oil come online, I could see it being reversed. Yeah, especially as a Montney producers increase their production um, potentially, but it's a catch-22 situation. The more heavy oil that comes online, the more the condensate supply demand goes out of whack. So even if the, the money producers increase condensate, they end up at the same spot uh, relative on a percentage basis. So you really end up at the same spot. Um, so I'm gonna give it less and less of a chance as I go. I still see it's on Enbridge's corporate presentation. so. Maybe it still happens, but um, I don't know. I, I would say later and later as we go. Um, Tamarack Valley, um, great company. I think they overpaid for their acquisitions. Um, as I've said before, I actually really like the company more and more now because A, the hedges they bought are put options, which I've been saying for a long time, the companies need to stop buying swaps and stop buying callers. They need to pony up the money and buy put options. And B, um, their wells are coming in really strong. 
their their, their clear water wells, some of their Charlie Lake stuff, I think is is performing well. But um, right now, it's just not on my radar. So I I haven't done the deeper dive on it. But uh, yeah, maybe a couple months down the road, I will. Um, what do you think about Razor? Um, I don't want to spike a micro cap play, so I'm not going to say too much. I will say that. If you look at my portfolio two years down the road, that might be the only company that's gonna be left in the portfolio because the upside on that company is not, in my opinion, yes, they have upside to the, to the current oil price and the lack of hedges, et cetera. But that company has a project in Swan Hills that if the CO2 pipeline gets built to this project, is going to be a company to hold for two, three, four years um, when I, I will probably end up selling the rest of my positions once the oil risk reward is not in my favor. Um, I might get, 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 get out of those positions, but Razor, I, I think is, a, is one that the upside, the hidden upside on the CO2 project is, um, yeah, a lot. And I've, I've personally worked in the Synovus slash white gap Weyburn CO2 flood and I know some of the economics on these projects, um, especially if the carbon pricing keeps going up, lots of potential, no recommendation. It's a very illiquid tight float. Please don't buy it as a, as a YOLO play. It's not a YOLO play. This is probably the most legit company out there from a production perspective and an upside to real production increase perspective. Um, and I almost think it's, uh, it's a non-YOLO play that I want to hold for a long, long time. Um, which options look good at the current share price? Uh, I, I, I can't answer that question. I, I, I have my calculator on the website, um, the options 101 video. I would suggest you look at that. And then the calculator, you, you just copy and paste what the option premiums are. And that's exactly what I use. Full disclosure, I, I find options that, I find companies that I wanna look at, I copy paste the options into the calculator. I run my own mental calculation on it as to where I think the company can get to and I buy the options. Uh, pretty simple as that. I don't look at implied volatility. I've never looked at Delta, Gamma um, or any of these things because I just don't think, I just don't think they matter. Um, generally speaking, how much margin are you comfortable using in your portfolio? Um, there's no number I can give you. It depends how I construct my portfolio. And I've, I've found a winning combination, I think. Um, it's worked for me for the last six months. Uh, famous last words, as they say, is uh, the person who was comfortable using margin and thought they had a winning position. That's what's gonna be written on my gravestone. Um, but you know what? I actively manage this portfolio. I spend 60 to 70 hours a week these days on oil equities, on reaching out to management, on following the markets and, and not just refreshing the, the stock prices. I mean, like looking into these companies, looking at well results, um, reaching out to people who know more about these assets, et cetera. So I, I have a different kind of um, comfort zone with these equities, given how much time I, I have to spend with them. Um, and it's also nice that a lot of the positions are, are in the green, which makes it easy to sell them on a big drawdown. Um, and I also spend a lot of time on the macro outlook, um, which, which, which gives me more comfort in where things are going as opposed to um, you know, a, a short-term play or a day trading kind of thing. Um, I also basically have a rough idea of the weekly supply demand dynamic. Um, and the difference we're in, in, in inventories, how much are they gonna drop week after week? Um, just given that I track stuff in the US, in Mexico, in Canada, in the UAE, in Singapore, Chinese inventories, Middle East, uh, demand all over the world. I, I'm subscribed to different things that give me a better idea. Um, so that's the long answer to your short question. Uh, there's no margin percentage that's good for, that's a, a, a winning combination. It should be, very adaptive and you should change it based on your portfolio construction um, as you go. 
Um, what's my take on Saturn oil and gas warrants? Um, the, I bought them based on a certain thesis. That thesis no longer is correct because of the recent deals that they've made. Thus, in full disclosure, that position will likely be out, out of my portfolio in short, in short order. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, I can get into all kinds of things, but um, that's that. Um, thoughts on Crescent Point. The company is going, is going to lag white cap. I can tell you that for a fact. If you take Crescent Point shares today and you take white cap today, you go three, six, 12, 24 months out, I can almost guarantee that white cap will win every single one of those. Um, why do I like Crescent Point right now? Because I got the options for basically nothing. I mean, whoever wrote those calls is, is not a happy camper um, at all. And um, I got in so cheap on these $5 US options for April that I'm gonna, I'm gonna leverage them as much as I can here. I have another month. I think the oil price stabilizes and continues to go higher. Um, and I think Crescent Point, just because it's such a known name, will get inflows. So I think I'm very close to selling them and I would sell them if there's a big bump one day, but um, yeah, very, very happy with Crescent Point options. The share price itself, I think will lag, um, will lag white cap. Um, yeah, again, just my opinion on that. Um, Ray is asking, why is Vermillion not a part of my portfolio? Um, I have so much exposure to the Vermillion options for December uh, in my personal portfolio that I think that's, I'm happy. The Vermillion options I have for December, 2022 are both up 475% or more in three months. And if my price target that I think, um, even if we don't get $130 for, for uh, Vermillion by next year, let's say we get to $70, $60. European gas continues to stay high. If we get to $70. Um, my options are gonna end up being a 30X or a 25X. I'm happy with that kind of leverage and playing the options that way. Um, and hence why Vermillion stock is not in my portfolio. Um, what's your take on Africa oil? I, I honestly don't know much about this company, but when there's so much juice left to squeeze in Canadian equities, why bother? Why bother going to Namibia and Africa and uh, uh, Brazil and uh, Guyana? Why bother? It's, you're taking on geopolitical risk and exploration risk for no reward. Um, these companies have not done well, let's be honest. Companies like, like uh, Pantheon and CGX and Recon Africa, they haven't done well in the last six months with the, with the price of oil rising. So why do you wanna play these risky plays is my question and, and hence why I, I really don't care. Um, and I haven't looked into it, you know, full disclosure. Um, do you still think gear is too richly valued? Um, people are, are not gonna like this answer, but, but Gear is, is one of the most overvalued companies in the sector, along with Headwater. I'll leave it at that. I think the free cash flow spreadsheet speaks for itself. Um, Gear wants to become a royalty company. They wanna have zero debt and they wanna become like a, like a royalty stream almost, which those aren't the companies you want. When the price of oil is going up, you want high debt, um, high debt companies, companies that are either growing a little bit, um, but you want financial leverage for sure. Um, and, and, and companies with higher free cash flow yields than eight or 10 or 12%. Um, what factors do you consider before closing out call options? Um, honestly, not much. I, when I think that the share price doesn't give me the additional bonus or the additional boost to the leverage that I require, um, when I'm happy with the gain I have, um, I just sell them. Like the Synovus option I sold for April, it was trading at the same, um, 
same as the underlying. Like if Synovus went up 20 cents, the option would go up 20 cents. So I had lost my leverage. I mean, I still had leverage because the option was less, uh, like the option was, was three bucks, whereas the uh, share is $20. So the 20 cents means different percentages to each. But when I had no time value left, I just said, you know what, whatever, I'm just gonna get rid of this and, uh, and, and, and move into something else. So I don't think too much about him because I treat call options like equities. And I've said this again, and people maybe get a bit confused as to what I mean, but the call option is basically to me an equity. That's it. And if I would sell the shares, I would sell the options, especially as they get closer to, to expiration. I have never exercised any options ever. Um, which companies do you find attractive for speculation um, based on hedges coming off? So I've talked about this before. I like Surge and Spartan Delta for the whole hedges coming off thing. Um, news, I like white cap because I think white cap gets a lot of funds flow from these net zero crowd um, who are getting absolutely trashed in the broad markets. And so they need some sort of oil exposure to avoid getting fired here when their performance review comes up. Um, and they're gonna justify it with white cap, which is a net zero company. They got carbon sequestration, they got a strong management, et cetera, et cetera. So I like white cap for that. Um, yeah, I've, I've mentioned some other ones and there's, there's not really too much else like the, I can't think of any of the top of my head anyways that, that I'm really focused on. The rest I'm just, um, I mean, my capital is fully invested. So I don't need to focus on these companies either. If I already have significant exposure to the top two with these sorts of um, catalysts, as I say. So I just haven't gone down the list. Um, yeah, so comment on T, I just commented on Tamarack Valley. Um, how much bank debts should surge reduce to or carry? Um, I believe they wanna to get to $265 million of total debt before the dividend starts, which is fine. Um, yeah, I think that's fine. And I think by the end of next year, they're gonna have to be totally gone out of the bank debt, which is fine. I would like them to keep continuing the debentures and the term debt. In fact, if they can get another $200 million of term debt uh, and start buying back shares, perfect. That's what I want. Uh, because if the oil price is gonna be 100 plus, 120, 130, and your net asset value is $35, $40 a share, your free cash flow times eight at those, let's say free cash flow times six at those source of oil pricing unhedged is like $30, $35 a share. Hell yeah, get more term debt and start buying back these shares. That's, that's the model that's gonna win out in the end as being the top performer. I can guarantee you that um, these debt-free companies are not gonna perform as well um, by any means. And, People are gonna think that I'm gone crazy and, and um, advocating for more debt and more share buybacks uh, using debt and such. But you know what? Every single one of us here on this call, you know, we say things that we like $70 oil and companies are generating cash flow, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But you're really investing for $100 oil and $120 oil. Let's, let's be real, let's be serious here. That's what you're investing for the upside at those sorts of pricings. So if we believe in that anyway, why do you want your companies to run their business as if oil is $60, right? The, the PTSD is real, the trauma is real, but you know what? We're just in a different pricing environment. Things have changed. Companies are not growing production at $100 oil. OPEC is dropping rigs at $100 oil. Oil is harder to find. My, my macro, that's why I spend so much time on the macro because once you're comfortable with the macro, it doesn't matter what's going on in the broad markets. It doesn't matter what's going on with windfall tax. It doesn't matter what's going on with, with the bank debt. It really doesn't matter um, because you get more of a higher level view of, of where things are going and you skate where the puck is going. Um, lots of questions, sweet, I love this. Uh, um, you, you've spoken recently about ARC resources, yeah. Um, yeah, something's really changed. Um, they, the, the stock price has been doing really well this year or this, this last week. Um, nothing has really changed. I think the European gas situation is getting more and more serious. Therefore, Henry Hub keeps going up. Therefore, ACO keeps going up. 
and ARC produces roughly one plus BCF a day, 1.2 BCF. Um, oil prices are going up. And I think people are just coming back into the sector. You see white cap is very strong. We saw Synovus very strong. Um, ARC resource is very strong. So I think capital is just looking for the deals. And um, you know, I still don't think they, they tell the story perfectly. So they're not off the hook by any means, but uh, um, they are benefiting and 52 week highs, always great to be at. Um, so yeah, I look forward to, to holding on to that position. And uh, maybe if Spartan Delta, I've spoken about this before, if Spartan Delta continues to lag a bit and ARC has this big jump here, I, I'm happy to switch a one for one switch right into Spartan Delta. Um, so I am keeping an eye out for that. Could you expand on Headwater? Um, Headwater trades at like $140,000 a flowing barrel. Uh, Meg is at 80,000, Surge is at 35, 40 or maybe 50,000 now. Um, why, why buy companies that are so, so uh, richly valued? And as far as I know, the rest of their acreage outside of the core has not panned out yet. So I'm still keeping an eye out on Headwater multilaterals outside the core. Um, are Synovus warrants looking good? Um, yeah, yes, I know it's warrants are good, but, but they just don't give you the real leverage you need. Like they're, they're basically like buying a 13 or what would it be? They're basically like buying a $6 strike option on Synovus. I mean, you can buy it, but it doesn't give you the right leverage if you're going to go into a warrant or an option anyway. Uh, but if you're going to buy shares anyway, and you don't want to buy options, well, yeah, you can get into the warrants and you get this little bit 10, 15% boost on top of that. So um, yeah, maybe that's the way you're thinking about it. So yeah, if you're buying Sonova shares anyway, why not buy the warrants? They're good till 2026, um, for sure. Any comment on smaller companies like Pulse Oil? Um, I don't know much about Pulse Oil, but the last time I looked into it was like three years ago or, or two years ago, and I heard it was a scam. So um, that's all I know. And again, why take on exploration risk? These companies are not giving you anything extra. Um, you can get the same results and the same share price appreciations on the public companies already. So why, why go into these sorts of companies? So I will disclose that I, I recently invested in, in two private equity plays targeting oil development, um, private placements, I should say one private equity, one private placement. Why did I invest in them? Because I'm, I'm looking at a 25 to 30 X return. If things go well, that's what I'm looking for. So when you look at Africa oil, when you look at Pulse oil and Frontera and, and or CGX, I should say, can you really see a 25 to 30 X potential? If you can't ask yourself, why are you taking on risk? Um, how large percentage wise is the new white cap position in the white tundra portfolio? Um, between the shares and the options, it's roughly a 6% uh, position. And the options that I have are a little bit different than the other options I'm used to buying. Um, so the leverage I have on the options here is much bigger than my historical option purchases. So, so just keep that in mind. Even though it's a 6% right now, if the options perform how I think they will, that percentage is actually, I have way more uh, exposure to the shares. Um, the, some of the white cap options, options I bought last week are up 40% already. So um, again, I'm not a genius. I'm just saying when the time comes, you know, you have to buy on the red days because nobody wants to buy on the green days. And then when the red days comes, I get messages like, well, people panicking that, that the, oil price is going to collapse and all this. Well, you're not winning either way then at that point. So you either buy on the red days or you buy on the green days. You, you can't have it both ways where you're, you, you want a dip, you want a dip, you keep messaging me that you want a dip. And then when the dip comes, you panic and say the oil price is crashing. Like I'm sure you, all of you have run into a similar friend or family member who has this exact same issue. Um, so I hope you can relate. Um, Enter plus. I just want to say again, for anyone that joined late, everything here is my opinion. None of this is investment advice. This is just what I see. 
Enterplus is a great company, well-run company. Um, Enterplus today is how Whitecap was six months ago or a year ago. They trade at too rich of a premium. Um, they actually have really good free cash flow still. So um, what I will say is Enterplus has a meeting coming up next week where they explain why their Bakken position is way better than, than everyone else. So I would advise that everyone on this call who wants to look at Enterplus, sign up for that. It's, um, I'll just share the link here while everyone is on the call. So you go to rbcrichardsonbar.com and on the left here, uh, under news right here, um, Enterplus schedules, upcoming analysts and investor update focused on the Bakken and why it's, it's uh, the best Bakken out of the rest of the junk. Um, April 12th, 9 to 10.30 a.m. Mountain Time. And I think it's open to retail investors. So you, you, you just have to sign up. Um, so please check that out, uh, Steve. I would recommend you, you check that one out. Um, and I'll wait for any comments on that for after that. Um, Petra's comment, um, great company. You, you don't bet against a great family. These people have, have grown um, Pato have grown. Pato was a hundred bagger in like four years or something. So lots of potential there. They've grown gear and now Petrus. Um, I'm watching the weld results. I'm looking at the weld results, the cardiums, seeing how they go. But again, Petrus doesn't give me the upside that I need to go into a company that's into this exploration development phase. Do I see a 10 bagger there? No, not really. So so why invest in, in companies like that, that are small and don't offer you the same upside or they don't offer you the risk adjusted reward that that's required. Um, Grand Tierra Energy. Um, if Brent goes to 130 or 150, this company is going to be a 10 X. And I think my, my price targets spreadsheet reflects that. Um, so, yeah, big potential, big potential there. I believe they're in Colombia, if I'm not wrong. So um, not much for geopolitical risk there. There's a lot of companies in Colombia focused on or headquartered in Canada. Um, but I'm just not in it at this point. Um, I can't give you a good reason. Uh, my portfolio is built a certain way and that's just how it's built. There, there's only enough names I want. I don't believe in diversification. So I pick my top five or my top seven and, and, and that's what I'm in. Um, and unfortunately some companies miss, just miss out. Um, can you repeat the comment on Tamarack Valley yeah, uh, quickly? So I think they overpaid for the acquisitions, but I like that they only buy put options on the hedges, which is great. Uh, gives you the upside on there. And so, some of the Clearwater and Charlie, Charlie Lake wells, I think are gonna come on really strong. So keeping an eye out on that. Um, what is your take on Athabasca? Um, lots of problems here. There's lots and lots of problems here. Between the Burgess royalty, the hedging, and the absolutely poor management style that's, that's going on here. Um, do they have upside? Yeah, for sure. They got lots of upside, but watch the Burgess royalty in particular. At some point, they're taking like 15% of your, of your um, uh, profit, not even profit. I think it's 15% of the revenue after transportation. So just keep an eye out on the upside and, and tapering your expectations as to how far it's gonna, it's gonna fly because they don't generate free cash flow. They always lose money on something or the other, um, whether it's pipeline contracts or I believe they lost 40 million because they had a contract with the Keystone Excel and, and TransCanada is not gonna give the money back or something like, it's always something dumb. And it's always something, every quarter, there's some damn thing that they lose money. And I've been following this company since 2016, I believe. So trust me, if you think things are gonna change, they're not. Um, okay, is surge management, I should go back and say, Athabasca is going to make a lot of money. So I've been wrong on it so far since it was at $1.25. Um, I, I may continue to be wrong because people just buy in anyway. But the real free cash flow, when the, when the earnings come out, people will wonder, well, where, where's all the money gone? And you will see some went to uh, the Duvernay not being as productive. Some went be, uh, 
to issues with Lysmer and Leesmer and Hanging Stone. Some went to the hedging, some went to the Burgess. Like it, it's just like um, I've used this analogy before. You you go to the bank with a dollar worth of coins in your pocket, and you end up at the bank with 30 cents or 25 cents because you lost a nickel there and somebody stole a dime, and you spent another 25 cents on an ice cream, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, is surge management on the same page as you regarding bank debt and leverage? Yes, yes, I believe so. Yeah, they, the term debt they recently took is termed out for five years. So that's not going to get paid back. The bank debt is going to get paid back slowly. The dividend is going to start before the bank debt is even paid off. That tells you the management knows what the macro is looking like for the next two, three, four, five years. Um, the debentures, I, I believe, might get paid off, but they might just extend them um, if they can. Um, when surge hedging comes off this summer, how much will sh the share price be impacted? Okay, so they go from producing at $100 WTI, they go from, produce, from producing roughly 200 and, 250 million, 260 free cash flow for, for the forward looking 12 months. They go from 260 to 400. So you run, let's just run a six multiple on it, add an extra. 140 million of free cash flow times six. Um, you get 840. They have roughly 83 million shares out. That's an extra $10 a barrel to the share price bang right there. And then you you go into January 1st, 2023, another 4,000 barrels come off, add another $10 to the share price. You can see why I get all these messages that that surge is surging the wrong way, it's lagging, you know, XYZ. And you know what, it doesn't really matter because I'm looking a year down the road and I'm, and I'm looking at a 25, 30, $35 share price. Run it on a flowing barrel uh, valuation, it may not make sense, but the, the management highlights this over and over and, and over. They, their capital costs are so low because they have low decline conventional reservoirs with 10 to 12 years of, of inventory and the market doesn't seem to care right now. I guarantee you, and, and I'm putting my money where my mouth is, that they will care a year down the road. When they see the low declines, they see the conventional reservoirs, they see the cookie cutter um, kind of drilling programs. Um, these things get ignored until they don't. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, where do you find options? So. The option premiums, you can go to Yahoo Finance, um, you can go to tmxmoney.com. Um, there's a lot of websites to find options. Your broker should have them too. Um, do you buy out of the money because they're cheaper to load up um, on options? I like to be as close to at the money as possible, but for companies like Vermillion, which were so crazily out of whack, like when I bought the options, the Canadian share, I think was at 10, no, the US share was at $10. So I bought the $10, which was at the money. And I'm like, wow, if this can really hit 40, 50, $60 in a year, like that's when I buy more out of the money. When I see the company not only getting to that out of money strike, but actually eclipsing it by a huge margin. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, there's gonna be no update to the website um, for the price target spreadsheet until all, almost all the results are out. Um, I just don't have the time right now to, because I like to be in the groove. Once I'm doing the free cash flow valuations, I like to do five, 10, 15, 20 in a row. Um, so I don't wanna just do Cardinal and in play and then you know have another one next week, et cetera. So give me a couple of weeks and I will update them um, accordingly from there. Um, yeah, Vermillion, love it. Just love it. Like anyone telling you that the European gas situation is going to fix itself, um, show me the data. I'd love to see the data because not only is Europe fighting for these gas molecules, Asian LNG demand is going up and there's no real new supply coming online um, for, for LNG export terminals, terminals in the US. So that means the people sending the gas are going to have this huge ARP. Um, arbitrage no matter what. So if Henry Hub is at $7, um, ACO is gonna be at six bucks and European gas is gonna be at 20, 30, $40 in MMBTU, perfect. Um, I don't see the situation fixing itself. European gas ended the year at 26% storage, which is almost the lowest ever. 
I saw a chart the other day that German storage was at zero in some of their biggest fields. So um, there's that. And then any day today, you could hear that Ukraine has shut the pipeline or Russia bombed the pipeline. What happens if that, if that news comes, comes on? I think uh, dare to dream as they say, and I, I, I wish that to not happen by any means. I, I wish all the best to everyone, but when you're looking at investments, you have to put a reasonable pie chart or expected value of what's gonna happen or what may happen, right? That's how you can invest. So if you put a 40% chance that that pipeline goes offline and Europe can't fill their summer storage, I think you, I think you know where I'm going with this um, in terms of Vermilion and there are 20,000 BOEs of, of, of European gas, um, which become unhedged into 2023. So uh, mostly unhedged. So as we go later and later in the year, people start running calculations on 2023 cash flow, 2023 uh, three free cash flow. The numbers are going to look pretty damn good. Like uh, I, is Vermilion going to become $130 stock? Like my, my price targets tell me. Um, I'd put a, I'd put a chance on it. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a good possibility that if, if something happens with this European gas pipeline coming in um, and European gas starts trading at 40, 50, 70 dollars US and MMBTU, yeah, why can't we really trade at 130? Um, so I'll leave that out there. Um, didn't the banks force surge into, ter into terrible hedges? Yeah, so they kicked out three or four unsupporting lenders um, so that the banks that they have now are happy with the hedging situation, they're not forcing them into anything. Um, and the bank debt is going to be gone by December. It's gone. So it's no longer an issue. And they, the banks just don't have the leverage anymore either. So at the time, the bank debt was a big part of their total debt. Now it, it's a smaller and smaller portion. So if somebody says, well, we want you to pay back this, the 30 million of debt. Well, they can actually go out on the markets and acquire term debt to pay off that bank debt. And, and I can guarantee you, and take my word for this, Surge can get enough term debt today to pay off their bank debt. If there's any, anybody trying to be stupid, any bank lenders trying to be, uh, you know, trying to pull a fast one, I can guarantee you, based on what I know, that they can get the term debt and so can many other companies. It's, it's not just a Surge thing. Um, with respect to insider buying and selling, I don't think of it too much. Um, I like to see buys. Hence why white cap is, is becoming more and more a darling of mine, um, if you will. Um, but it's, it doesn't impact my final investment decision by any means. Um, I don't, but if companies are selling shares, I do pay attention. So Athabasca, not good. Uh, Meg Energy, somebody just sold 20,000 shares. And you know, I'm looking at that fellow and saying, look, what are you doing? Um, it's, it's just not a good sign. So I'm, I'm gonna look at Meg more closely, but uh, it just offers such a free cash flow valuation that I'm not gonna sell just because somebody sold uh, 20,000 shares. Um, we know Pipestone doesn't pass your screen. Do you have any insight of what Eric Nardle sees in Pipe? Um, I have an opinion, but I don't wanna share it just, just because he has his own investment thesis, his own investment way of doing things. And it's not my, my mandate or my job to, to nitpick or, or um, uh, judge, judge somebody on their investment thesis. So um, I guess I have my own thesis. I don't see it as attractive and I'll leave it at that. Um, the EU has a proposed energy security policy that mandates storage getting to 90% going into next winter. Um, yeah, so I thank you, Dirk. Uh, for sharing that. And I mean this in the nicest way possible. Um, I also have a policy that mandates that I should be a billionaire by next winter. Doesn't mean it's gonna happen. You, you need physical gas molecules and oil barrels and, 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 and money to get each of us to our goals. So I guess what I'm saying is, I don't think it's gonna happen. Just based on the lack of supply, the increased demand and the geopolitical risk on top of that, um, 
the US doesn't export that much LNG. Like um, some people seem to think that the US can just export a bunch of LNG into Europe and fill this the storage. Like 13 or 14 or 16 BCF is not that much. When you look at how much Europe uses, I think it's like, don't quote me on this, but I think it's like 80 or 90 BCF a day that they use. Um, so LNG helps, it's a drop in the bucket. It doesn't change the overall um, what's going on. Um, can you talk about a juggernaut like, like CNRL? Um, yeah, CNRL still has a ton of upside, both because of natural gas and oil. So if you don't care about any of this, you, you just wanna put your money somewhere, collect dividends, um, share buybacks, buy CNRL uh, and just leave it there. Come back two years later, collect your 3X and, and, and move on. Um, so it's really crazy how these blue chips are, are, are offering such great upside. Um, really awesome, uh, great. And, and it's easy for me because for me to pitch some of these more spook investors, for me to pitch CNRL to them is easier than pitching a Baytex or a Spartan Delta or a Surge. Um, so yeah, it's great. It's a great company. Do you ever consider pre-production uh, oil ENPs like Pantheon? Uh, again, no, I, I just don't care. I, why take the risk? Like, why are people buying companies like this? They, they produce 10 barrels or 100 barrels out of their well. And the place where they drilled was supposedly the best of the best of their acreage. I know they didn't frack all the stages or, or whatever, but what's going on? Why are we waiting? Oil is at $120, like, let's go, let's get this done and, and get oil onto production. And then maybe I can focus on a stock like that. But until then you're just making up nonsense about uh, we can produce this and we can do this and do that. And um, uh, I just don't bother um, personally. Do you think Surge will surpass production estimates uh, in the first quarter? So um, they had a fire at one of their facilities that decreased production for the whole quarter uh, by 125 barrels a day. So if that didn't happen, I would say yes, by a big time. Uh, but um, conservatively, I run everything at those production numbers. Can they hit 22,000? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. They had one well in, in Southeast Saskatchewan, which is by far the top well in Southeast Saskatchewan. And it paid out in like 27 days or some. Um, and why do I keep mentioning Surge? Because they bought Astra Oil and Fire Sky, two companies, private companies that have already delineated Southeast Saskatchewan. They know exactly where the top wells are. And watch, watch Surge, um, that list I shared of the top, top 15 wells in Canada and whatnot. Um, Surge had the top well in Southeast Saskatchewan. It had three of the, of the top 15. Um, and I bet you it's gonna have more and more because there's no geologic risk. There's no exploration risk. There's no development risk really. Um, they, they let the private companies do the, do the biding of the time and um, they, they reap the rewards. Um, I don't know about any other European gas producers. Uh, Serica Energy is one that because I'm covering it next week on the Saturday session, I will be doing more research, but those are the only two I really know. Uh, Vermilion and, and Serica. Uh, Vermilion Romania. Uh, so yes, uh, Vermilion has been doing some exploration work behind the scenes. They have a ton of acreage all across Europe. If you look at their map of acreage in Europe, you will be shocked how, how much gas supply they control in Europe. So they have been doing some behind the scenes work, I believe in Romania and Croatia. Um, they've hit some really good wells and um, I don't know more, that's all I know. And uh, the more European gas I can bring online, uh, the better. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't wanna to talk too much about Vermilion, but I'll tell you anyone who questioned me on the $130 share price target, you're absolutely in your right to do that. And my, my response is watch it happen. And I, I've invested accordingly because I think it's gonna happen. Um, with the expected value of all the outcomes that can happen. If, if we have the lowest case scenario happen where uh, European gas somehow fills up, 
um, and everything is good, um, you know, things are different. But but my point is, can it get to 130? Oh yeah, I can see many cases where Vermilion can get to 130 dollars a share um, in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, haha, Dirk, great great minds think alike, and I appreciate it. Uh, Sarcasm doesn't really come across on chat, so I, I apologize. But um, yes, yes, they are desperate. They are very desperate for European gas. People, um, people in Europe, if you go by history, when people in Europe feel like the, the governments are doing uh, too much uh, bullshitting around, as we say, uh, and screwing around with their livelihoods, we know what the people in, in Europe can get up to. So um, yeah, yeah, I agree with you there. Thank you. Um, social unrest in Peru. Um, yeah, this is very interesting. So I was in a Peru uh, petrotal group that maxed out at 75 people on Twitter because Twitter only allows 75. I asked the, pe the person who started the group, can you please make a second one? Um, it's already maxed out with 75 different people in two weeks, two or three weeks. So I don't wanna make any comments on this. I will let people join the group. Um, we'll make a third group if there's enough interest. And basically we just copy paste articles and people are looking at like Facebook groups of these uh, protesters. People are reading newspapers in Peru. Um, they're attending like, like uh, webinars and whatnot and, and they can tell you way more about what's going on um, than I could. Um, So Saturn could have 50 million diluted shares and 10,000 BOEs in a couple of years. It should be at a 400 million market cap. Am I missing something? Um, yeah, I invested on that same thesis right there, exactly as you say. And management lost my trust to the point where um, I, I could say some very choice words about what I think is going on, but I'll, I'll hold back uh, just to be professional. So um, yeah. What could happen, what should happen, um, there's signs that may, may not happen. Um, so Jack is asking, barring any more fires on Surge's properties, um, I think second quarter production can exceed 22,000. I think 22, even could get up to 22,500, depending on these multi-leg horizontals that they're drilling um, in Provost and in Macklin. If they pan out, um, we could, yeah, we could be 22,500. And, it may not sound like much, but an extra thousand barrels of, of oil, not BOEs, but oil, um, you know, extra, extra thousand BOEs, let's say the net back on Southeast Saskatchewan oil and Sparky oil at hundred dollar oil is roughly 80, 70, 75, 80, because they don't pay much royalties anyway, um, Surge. Um, and they have like five years of tax pools. So um, that's, uh, $80,000 $80, a day. So um, all free cash flow, basically, because the operating cost doesn't go up, the GNA doesn't go up. Um, so $80,000 a day is roughly $30 million a year. Put a six multiple on it. That's $2 a share just by in increasing production by a thousand barrels. So um, the little things really matter for companies that are mid, uh, small to mid cap. Um, do you have a high level outlook on oil and gas service firms? Um, I had the same outlook as I did two weeks ago and a month ago um, until my contacts in Grand Prix tell me that these companies are actually making money. They can raise rates. Uh, I'm just not looking at them. Um, I don't know if the person is on the call here, but uh, I was exposed to, to a different kind of service company. Um, not drilling, not completions, not, not, uh, uh, workovers and stuff. There's there's many other subsects of the oil and gas service industry. So one of them may be, may be on, the, on a path to making a ton of money. Um, I don't want to share it because it's an illiquid micro cap and I don't want people jamming in the name um, and then messaging me as to why it's not moving or, or why they bought at the high and whatnot. But um, keep your eye out on the service industry, like, like not drilling, not completions, but other parts of the industry where if the price of their product or their service goes up by three or five or 10 X, it doesn't make a difference. Um, and people have to pay it. 
um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I think um, read, read Essential Energy's Q4 results report. They said that they're having a ton of trouble passing on costs and the ENPs don't wanna increase pricing. Um, so when, when I read that on a company's Q4 report, why would I buy the company? They obviously are not at that inflection point um, yet. What's the best way to play LNG going forward? Um, natural gas producers really in Canada, that, that's where you wanna be. Um, bigger ones that can make, make long-term contracts, CNRL, Tourmaline, ARC, ARX. Um, that's basically it. They're, the rest of them are, are going to get bought out. Birchcliff, Crew, and all this other stuff, um, they're all going to be gone by the time LNG comes online. Um, and they're not going to get a premium either. Maybe a 10, 15% premium, but um, not more than that. Because if LNG Canada comes online and these little companies don't have uh, deals, offtake deals with, with, with LNG Canada, what are they? they they're marketing a pro product that, that really doesn't really have a... a a sales stream, if you will. Um, when the big boys come in, yeah, the, some of the small companies may not get the premium that you think they will. Um, Bonterra and Obsidian, um, we're getting up to about two and a half hours here, so I wanna um, end this, but um, Bonterra, I, I discussed in my last, in one of the previous um, valuation sessions, I talked about well results and such, so I will, say you should look at that. Um, Obsidian is, is gonna do great. Obsidian, if I didn't have Surge, I would be in Obsidian. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think it's a great company. Um, they don't have too much oil hedged. They got the Peace River Oil Partnership with some pretty decent wells coming online. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, heavy oil, heavy oil gives you better net backs, the higher oil price goes. Heavy oil is hated when oil price is low. Heavy oil is loved when oil price is high. Please remember that. White cap options that I'm invested in. Um, no, I got the um, June, August, and September 2022. I have kind of a different thesis where I think this summer, there's gonna be so much subsidies and stimulus and no demand destruction that um, this, you almost wanna have at this point, the options that I'm buying, I'm looking at a three to five to six month Time frame because um, after that, once the September, October, November hits, I don't know what's going to happen with the oil thesis. You might have a lot of demand destruction occur at the same time. Um, so I like June, August, September, and people were willing to sell them to me into my bid, which is uh, great. Um, and I guess we'll see how things go. Um, do you think you're, you'll roll into the service side? I doubt it. I don't think I will, no. I, I think once the time comes to exit this, this trade, I will exit entirely. I have other, other things that I'm looking at on the private side. Um, if I can invest in a private well in, in Alberta or Saskatchewan and have a 10, 15, 20, 30 X potential, um, why play the service side anyway? That's kind of where I am. Um, what are your thoughts on your Vista? Um, I'll save it for when I'm gonna be going through the, the company, but what was a negative for them being these long, long-term long offtake processing agreements has become a positive in a way. So just keep that in mind. They were, they were forced in these long-term take or pay contracts. Now they're in a positive place because companies are having trouble finding gas processing in the Pipestone, Wembley, uh, Carr, Montney, you know, Grand Prairie area. Companies are having trouble finding gas processing capacity. New Vista has take or pay for more than their current production. So they can easily grow and have the right uh, processing capacity. Um, right on. Well, I will, uh, I don't see any more questions. So I'll kind of end it here. Um, you're welcome to contact me. Um, I'll be active on Twitter spaces as well as we go. I have an interview coming up on Tuesday evening um, where I'll be taking questions off Discord. Um, so, if you're interested in, in some of the more valuation specific questions, um, I look forward to sharing more on that as to the valuation um, of certain companies and such. Um, and uh, yeah, what else do we have coming up? We got the 
ROK resources uh, on Twitter Spaces next Tuesday or this Tuesday, 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, I still have freehold royalties. Well, we still have freehold royalties um, on deck. We still have Pretty Provident on deck. Um, Royal Helium and an, another helium company are, are also, I'm working on them. So um, yeah, we'll just keep on keeping on, keep this movement going. Uh, thanks to everyone again. That takes time out on your Saturdays. Love it. I, I, I love the support that I get and the questions and people tuning in. Um, once again, the recording will be on the website. So please uh, check it out, share it, um, um, have a look, uh, check out the old macro stuff and all that. And uh, I have an, um, the second stage of my price targets is coming out, which will have live. Um, so all the charts that Eric, Eric Nuttall puts out, that Jeremy McRae puts out, all those charts will be live, updated as, as the markets change, as the uh, share prices change, they will auto update. Um, so I look forward to, to launching that. Um, I've spoken a lot in the past about these, these banks and they don't really put the work in. And you know what? I think uh, it's time that I walk the walk and, and actually do something about it. So um, yeah, so I look forward to, to launching that. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just kind of go from there. I'll, I'll share links to the ROK resources chat and the Discord chat, the spaces sessions um, on my Twitter. So please keep an eye out for that. And uh, thanks to everyone else in the Canadian oil mafia who puts in the work, who take time to run, run spaces, run presentation, uh, get people educated and, and outside the energy ignorance. So um, appreciate all you do, uh, bless. And um, yeah, thanks again. And uh, we will uh, see you at the next one.